Davy PhD's Mythbusters, episode 8, 14th of September 2020. Many things are said about various issues surrounding Scotland, our relationship with the UK, the EU, independence, etc. So in these videos, I'm going to bust the myths that many people believe. This week's myth is the one where people say, I'm Scottish and British, and I don't want to have to choose between the two. Many people fear that independence forces citizens to choose, on some existential level, between their Scottish identity and their British identity. And the independence is going to divide friends and family and make people foreigners. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are a few hardliners on the fringes of the independence movement who would argue that being Scottish and British is incompatible, but they couldn't be more wrong. For every legitimate unionist party making a reasonable argument to stay with the union, there are loads of little groups of fringe nutters with more fundamentalist views, like Britain First, the EDL, the BNP. Currently, there are only two independence parties. There may be a third soon, and there is one who supports the idea, but they're not exclusively an indie party. But just like the unionist side of the coin, we've also got our own little groups of fringe nutters, and they've given us a bad name as well. And it's the vocal fringe nutters that forward this argument and poison the debate, whether it's from the independence side or the unionist side. Now, being a unionist is a legitimate political position. It just happens to be one I disagree with. Yeah? And though I would exhale my last breath in opposition to the union, I would equally exhale it in defence of your right to hold unionist views. Just because an argument is contrary to yours doesn't mean it's unreasonable. And being Scottish doesn't mean you're not British. At least, not yet. There is already a country which has left the UK. The Republic of Ireland. And though their departure from the UK was long, protracted and not without suffering, relations since have not made foreigners of the Irish. Ireland's relationship with the UK is defined in UK law in the Ireland Act of 1949, which specifically says that it is not a foreign country. And that allows for reciprocal rights built on a common travel area of the two countries which was established in 1923. People can travel, work, live and settle between the two countries, much as we could when we were in the European Union. And despite having its ups and downs, Ireland is thriving, with our citizens enjoying a good quality of life. Scottish independence could actually facilitate and allow for a new era of Britishness, which is cultural, civic, social, and not about political governance. If the UK were enlightened enough, Britishness could become a geographic identity, in the same way being Nordic or Scandinavian is. Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, Norway and Sweden, along with the territories of the Faroe Islands, Åland Islands and Svalbard, share many historical, cultural, industrial and social similarities, but they also have many differences. They cooperate, like in the Nordic Union, but they also compete where it is individually advantageous. They are separate and distinct from their neighbours, but they still work together, still cooperate. They're all Norwegian, they're all Swedish, but they're also all Nordic and Scandinavian, and are generally all proud to be both. Having worked with Norwegians and Swedes extensively in the past, I can assure you the banter is just as brutal and funny between them as it can be between English and Scots people in a similar environment. But while the ribbon is brutal and bloody funny, the respect is there. Always. I believe that independence is now inevitable. And with the eventual breakup of the UK as a sovereign nation, that will follow. A future where the United Kingdom is replaced by a British Union, along similar lines to the Nordic Union, would be a great destination for all four countries of the current United Kingdom. I envisage a future where devolution doesn't end as Holyrood becomes a proper national parliament. A future where the Shetland Islands, the Orkneys, the Western Isles are offered the chance to become self-governing territories like the Isle of Man or the Faroe Islands. A future where there may be a Highland Assembly sitting in Inverness and an Eastern Assembly sitting in Aberdeen. A future where our largest cities could have metropolitan mayors like London, Liverpool and Manchester. 
And I envisage a future where all four nations of the current United Kingdom form a British Union, cooperating where needed and competing where it's individually advantageous, forging our own paths and finding our own new places in the world. There is no reason that that relationship between the nations of this new British Union could not exist. Well, that's not entirely true. There is one reason. Boris Johnson. Looking at the way he leads the government with the EU withdrawal agreement, it doesn't bode well for the future. His behaviour is more like that of a petulant child than that of the statesman he envisages himself as. It's kind of like our UK let the fringe nutters run the country. And a future where being British could be preserved in the same vein as being Nordic or Scandinavian becomes less and less po possible as Boris Johnson's behaviour deteriorates further. If he were to deal with Skexit in the same manner as he dealt with Brexit, then Britishness will die with the Union. Now it's clear that he doesn't listen to the independent support and majority in Scotland, so I'm afraid that this idea will fall to the unionist minority to promote to Johnson and our UK. Otherwise, Britishness will disappear. The old phrase, the lunatics are running the asylum, has never made more sense than it does now when applied to the UK government. The UK cabinet is basically comprised of the European Research Group, ERG, which were the Brexit wing of the party, and they were as close to being fringe nutters as possible in a mainstream party, led by an incompetent charlatan. Contrast that with Scotland. Cool, calm, assured leadership of Nicola Sturgeon. Clear messaging, consistently competent, and with our people foremost in our thoughts. This is the kind of governance that we will be free to choose in an independent Scotland. Now we've all seen that guy Sean Clark and the ultra indie fringe nutter with his English out of Scotland sings. His message is no place in the indie movement. But if he lived in England and was a unionist, he'd probably be in Boris Johnson's cabinet. Now, yes, no referenda are always binary in nature. But if you find yourself in a position where friendships and family relationships deteriorate, it actually says more about those personal relationships than the political climate they exist in. Relationships as weak as that would have ended over football, religion, or something else if they hadn't ended over politics. My brother voted Conservative in the last election, but I'm an adult, and so is he. I still love him, I still bought him a Christmas present last year, and I'd still do anything for him. A British Union, along the lines of the Nordic Union, would be a brilliant place for all four nations of the current UK to inhabit. It's possible, and it's achievable, if reasonable people on both sides of this debate manage to tune out the noises made by the fringe nutters. Now that's easier for Scots than it is for English people, because unfortunately, our UK's fringe nutters are now cabinet ministers. On the 7th of June 1905, Norway became independent from Sweden. As we all know, on the very next day, the 8th of June 1905, the Norwegian sky came crashing down. Without a sky, there was no sunlight. Pretty soon, crops rotted in the fields and the population starved. In the 1920s, the four horsemen of the apocalypse were out for a ride on their satanic steeds. They decided a ride through Norway looked like fun. They had a hoot and a holler riding through the beleaguered country, leaving nothing behind them but plague, pestilence and scorched earth. Soon after becoming an economic basket case with no arable land, the Norwegians asked Sweden if they wouldn't mind terribly recolonising their failing nation. Now, we all know those last few sentences were bullshit. Only the first sentence was true, where Norway claimed their independence. The rest of it is absolute crap, invented by me right now. As we all know, 115 years of independence has been the best thing that ever happened to Norway. But they're still friends with our neighbours, Sweden. Both nations benefit from being in the Nordic Union. Fast forward to around 2023, when Scots declare their independence from the United Kingdom. 
Will we begin our independence, laying the groundwork for a new British Union? Or will we start with rancour and division? And where were all four of the current UK nations be in the 115 years that Norway has been independent? I know what the vast majority of indie-minded Scots want. I want the future where we don't try to delete the UK part of our history, where we acknowledge it, where it's bad we confront it, where it's good we celebrate it, together. Where we cooperate and compete in equal measure. Where we finally become a union of equals. And I suspect that's the same thing most other currently British people want too. Just because we don't want this doesn't mean we don't want this. Folks, thanks for watching. Um, please comment on the Facebook page. Keep it civil. Share this video with a unionist. It's as much for them as it is for the indie side. Um, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday for PhD Cues. Take your PhD.